Before we begin, thank you very much to Jonathan C. for joining the Patreon campaign over at patreon.com forward slash TJ Omega. Guys, the help means the world to me. I thank each and every one of you who is pitching in. And for those who can't, that's perfectly fine. I know things suck right now. Things are expensive. But hitting the like button and hitting the subscribe button is completely free, and that helps me out a lot too. However you are assisting the channel, it is greatly appreciated. I got curious the other night. We talk a lot about the pre toy the pre Transformer toy lines, and a lot of times it just kind of gets defaulted down into Diaclone. I think the default thing in people's brain when they think the toys that created the Transformer brand is Diaclone to the point where that's just the general term you use. But it's a lot more than that. A lot more than that. So I got a little bit curious and I decided to start crunching numbers. Let's go and take a look at all of the Transformers that made up the first three years and see where exactly they all came from to get an idea of just how many toy lines it took to create the brand. I say the first three years because everything after that was designed for Transformers and released as Transformers, so there's no real point to exploring those figures. For now, we're going to stick to the first three years, and that is of course going to start with Diaclone, the lion's share of the entire toy line. So, Diaclone started off as some very futuristic robot and uh, and later shape changing robot uh, vehicles. There's some really cool gimmicks in Diaclone, like some really cool. There's like uh, like treadmill and ramp gimmicks that are actually really impressive for the time. Uh, take a look. Some of the old Diaclone commercials will show you just how wild those things got. But this was a different direction for Diaclone, where they started producing realistic vehicles, and as a added bonus. Most of the ones you see here had some way of fitting a mini driver because the Diaclone toys were piloted robots. They were not sentient ones like we know Transformers to be. Much different concept in Japan. So, let's name them off and uh, see how fast this, this can go. Blue Streak Hound, Ironhide, Jazz, Mirage, Prowl, Ratchet, Sideswipe, Sunstreaker, Trailbreaker, Wheeljack, Scarscream, Skywarp, Thundercracker, Optimus Prime. The Power Dashers, Drill Type, F1 Type, Jet Type. The Omnibots, Camshaft, Downshift, Overdrive, Top Spin and Twin Twist, Bombshell, Kickback, Shrapnel, Grapple, Hoist, Inferno, Red Alert, Skid, Smokescreen, Tracks, the Constructicons, Bone Crusher, Hook, Long Haul, Mixed Master, Scavenger, Scrapper, Blitzwing, Grimlock, Slag, Sludge, Snarl, Swoop, Dirge, Ramjet, Thrust, Ultra, Magnus. Whew. 49 toys in all came from Diaclone. And when you start looking back at those, you can kind of see where the aesthetic was pretty similar across all of those figures. <sighs> so that's the one we often think of, right? So second place goes to just things that were designed for the Transformer brand first and foremost. Everything that was a Hasbro and or Takara design and sculpt that was never part of any series prior to Transformers. This is just kind of where we lump in all the original stuff from the first three years, and it didn't even begin until year two with the new mini-bots. So, Beachcomber, Cosmos, Powerglide, Sea Spray, Warpath, and then later on Wheelie in year three. However, we continue on because Blaster in... Uh, the toy line we haven't talked about yet, when his pre-Transformer figure was a working FM radio that couldn't actually hold cassettes. So, all of his cassettes were also designed for the ha for the Transformer line. So, uh, that includes uh, Rewind, Steel Jaw, uh, Eject, and Ramhorn. We throw in Ratbat as well as another new one for Soundwave that didn't previously exist. So... Beyond that, we have Runabout, Runamuck, Broadside, Sandstorm, Springer, Blur, Hot Rod, Cuff, Rodimus Prime, Wreckgar, Dive Bomb, Headstrong, Rampage, Razorclaw, Tantrum, Gnaw, Cyclonus, Scourge, Galvatron, and Trypticon. So, all the all the ones from the movie, obviously. Um, that, was an inter that was a weird situation where the movie was done before the toys were, so... For the first time, they had to design something based off of existing material, 
which is why some of the movie toys are a little bit weird compared to past Transformers. It's why the aesthetic shifted so much between them two. Uh, they're larger, uh, they're more defined faces, for instance, uh, a little bit more characterful and colorful than previous uh, year's offerings. You can definitely tell the tone shift here. And when you start thinking about this and the aesthetic that a lot of these went for, yeah, you can kind of see where, uh, where the difference lies. Next up, uh, you might not even recognize this line. So, Jizai Gatai was actually a planned subset of Diaclone. So technically these 23 figures are part of the Diaclone franchise, but they weren't released for Diaclone. They were released originally for Transformers. They were fully developed, ready to go, but when Transformers took off so huge in Japan, they scrapped Jizai Gatai and decided to make them uh, Transformer toys the following years. So um, this includes all everything we consider Scramble City, and that includes Metroplex, who was designed to work with those Scramble City figures. However, we also have evidence to show that Astro Train and Octane were likely planned for this line as well. They were not Diaclone like Blitzwing. They were going to come a little bit later. So this is in this weird little subset where technically it's Diaclone, but it wasn't pre-Transformer. It was designed for Diaclone, released as Transformers, which is why I've separated Jizai Gatai out as its own thing. So aside from those that I already mentioned, Air Raid, Fireflight, Silverbolt, Skydive, Slingshot, Breakdown, Dead End, Dragstrip, Motormaster, Wild Rider, Blades, First Aid, Groove, Hotspot, Streetwise, Blastoff, Brawl, Onslaught, Swindle, and Vortex. All part of this uh, toy line that never actually happened. But hey, we get to enjoy them as the Scramble City Combiners in Transformers and all the uh, all the brand new ones that were done specifically for the Transformers brand that followed that play pattern thereafter. Beyond that, we get to one that is familiar, Micro Change. This was an extension of Micro Man, which is a weird... <laughs> it's an interesting toy line. So Micro Man were these translucent, basically uh, space-age robot action figures with super high articulation for the day. They were inspired by 12-inch G.I. Joes, but they were 3 and 3 quarter inch, which is what inspired G.I. Joe to produce the Real American Heroes line at that size, using essentially the same engineering. So it's this weird little stop gap that Takara did that bridges the classic G.I. Joe and the modern ones that most people are familiar with now. But Microman had an extension toy line of transforming figures called Micro Change that involved very tiny versions of vehicles, but also things that turned into essentially one-to-one -one scale real-world objects. A lot of them were released in Japan. Only a few actually became Transformers. We missed out on various other pistols, binoculars. Uh, there's a range of just household items that could have been oddball Transformers. We got very, very few of them. So what we did get was Bumblebee Bumper, not not Bumble Jumper, Cliff Jumper, uh, Auto Scepter, D Scepter. Those are the those were the watches and Caltor, the calculator. Soundwave, of course, and then his subsequent cassettes, Buzzsaw Frenzy, Laserbeak, R Rumble, and Ravage. Megatron, of course, Blaster, Perceptor, and Reflector. All from the Micro Change line. And again, that kind of makes sense when you think about uh, the, diff the difference in aesthetics. Though these are still Takara produced, so we're still in that neighborhood. These actually fit in pretty well with the, re with the rest of the Diaclone figures and most of the other pre-Transformer toys. Uh, we did miss out on a lot. Go look up Microchange sometime. There's some really interesting ones, including a, including a couple of guns I think actually looked better than Megatron. Uh, later on in... Uh, no, that, that would be in... Uh, I was going to say Headmasters, but it would actually be in Master Force. We got uh, Browning. Uh, which was another one of the uh, micro-change handgun transformers. A little bit more solidly designed than Megatron, strangely enough. Moving on from here, we get into something that was more recently discovered. So, Mysterians. This is a weird one. 
So, um, I want to say the toy company was called Knickerbocker. I might be mistaken on that. It's something weird like that. But it is a toy line that had two different ideas. It was going to be small vehicles, but it was also going to be a few geometric shape transformers. They're supposed to be like little tool robots. Well, the company got bought out, so uh, and uh, the subsequent molds got broken up. So Hasbro bought the company uh, prior to the launch of Transformers. Uh, Takara got possession of the molds that would become Brawn, Windcharger, Gears, and Huffer. Those got released as uh, micro-change mini cars. Uh, the other, the other figures that were designed, the ones that were uh, just those little geometric shapes, were released in America as Mysterians by a completely different company. We have no idea if Takara was involved in that at all, if they somehow recovered the molds and produced them themselves, if they bought the rights for the late name and the unused molds from Takara, all of that is still buried. But it's pretty recent we found out that four of these Transformers came from a completely defunct, canceled toy line, and no one was even the wiser for a long time. So along with those, because they are remolds of those particular figures, we are including Outback, Swerve, Tailgate, and Pipes as Mysterians figures. So there is one more toy line that gets added into the DNA. And a really weird storyline to that one too. Takara released a line called Mecha Warriors, which included the toys that we eventually called Mini Spies. Uh, also, by the way, uh, thank you for TransformersLand.com for providing this image and a few more we're going to see for the rest of this video. Um, this is really the only source that actually has a lot of this stuff. Um, this is the only is usually the only place where I can find like really good uh, images, and uh, you know I thank them for their cooperation. So mini spies were a weird little gimmick. They were packed in with the mini bots in year two, but. The weird thing about them was uh, the gimmick to them was you didn't know what faction they were until you rubbed the, the symbol, until you actually put heat to the rub sign. They came in three different colors, yellow, white, or blue, and they had four different molds, Jeep, Buggy, FX1, and Porsche. They could be any combination of those colors, any combination of those molds, any combination of those faction symbols. And on top of all of those variations, there are also small tooling differences, like the names on the tires. So, according to TF Wiki, as many as 72 variations on the Mini Spy could actually exist. For the sake of this list, and considering it's all just one kind of big gimmick revolving around four figures, I am giving it a score of four, Otherwise, 72 would dominate this list very unfairly. But yeah, they are just like a really weird little little addition. Uh, Mecha Warrior is not even that big of a toy line for Takara. You know, I couldn't really find a whole lot on it. But it is another one that goes into the genealogy. Along with Beatrass, or let's see if I can remember the actual... <laughs> can I remember the actual name? Armored Insect Battalion, Beatrass. We got the Deluxe Insecticons from this toy line. This was when Hasbro was kind of desperate to fill the demand for Transformers. There's only so many toys left in Diaclone that were viable. They had to go wherever they could. So, uh, they actually had to go to uh, what would eventually be one of their biggest competitors. And that was Bandai. Bandai had previously bought a company called... Takatoku, which is the toy, the company that produced Beatrass. Of course, we got Barrage, Chop Shop, Ransack, and Venom from that toy line. But that's not all we got from Takatoku. When I say that toy company's name, the one you're probably going to think of the most is Dorvac. Those were pretty distinct figures we got as deluxe vehicle Autobots, Whirl and Roadbuster. Now you look at those two, and there's definitely some genealogy there. You can definitely tell they came from the same company. Dorvac didn't really do too hot. Uh, neither did Beatress. Um, the company was kind of sinking when those toy lines came out. Uh, but there was uh, one in particular that was 
on Bandai's mind when they bought it. Macross. Macross is so heavily produced by Bandai these days that it's pretty easy to forget that Takatoku was the company that actually produced it for the first time. This is probably the only brand from that entire buyout that uh, Takara actually used and probably the only one they were ever interested in. And of course, this is where we get Jetfire and all the legal fun that came from that particular character, whether it was having to adapt him differently for the cartoon with a completely different name or taking Harmony Gold to court uh, over the likeness of the character. It's a complex, a complex thing. But again, um, it is known to be one of the Bandai's like holdouts that we're probably never seeing this mold again. We're, we're at least not as Jetfire, but it's another one on the pile. It gave, hey, all Hasbro really cared about was it gave them a big Christmas toy uh, in the early days of Transformers. But we have a few other distinct uh, toy lines to go through. Toy Box was another company that uh, gave us a few more of the large scale figures that Hasbro was in desperate need of. We got from them Omega Supreme and Skylinks, which Okay, compared to the other ones on this list, you cannot look at those two and go, oh yeah, the same toy company came up with those. Such radically different concepts. But still, two very distinct ones that did give Transformers a little bit of much-needed variety in the early days. And, you know, Omega Supreme, of course, found a really good niche in the cartoon and kind of the same niche that Skylynx found himself in as like the big character who could transport everybody. The fun part about Toy Box is that eventually Takara did end up buying this company and upon searching through the factories, ended up just discovering the Omega Supreme and Skylynx molds probably not even aware that's where they came from. Skylynx himself never had a proper release in Japan, making his Encore figure the first time it was actually available as a Transformer in Japan. Weird how that happens. But we are coming down to the end here. The last one I could think of is a company called Toyco, and they produced Sound or Shockwave, rather. Uh, yeah, pretty cut and dry on this one. Toyco really only produced that one that Transformers ended up using. Uh, of course, we also we also know its original use for for Radio Shack and the uh, Galactic Man figure. You'll excuse me if I'm using a picture of the Hallmark ornament because I couldn't find a really good shot of uh, Shockwave in robot mode, but you, you get the idea. You get the idea. So, uh, all in all. If I'm counting this up right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 different toy lines is what it took to create the original three years worth of Transformers from numerous different manufacturers and companies. And to demonstrate this, I made a pie chart. The first pie chart I've ever made in my life, you people better appreciate the work I do for you. I had to go, this was boring work, but I think it's interesting to look at because of just how much it shows. We got 141 toys represented in the original G1 toy line and 34, just about almost 35% of that line is Diaclone. It takes up, of course, the, you know, the biggest wedge on the pie. If we include Jizai Gatai as a Diaclone line, as it was originally intended to be, then this then Diaclone would actually take up just over half of all of the original toys in Generation 1. I think what's most telling about the pie chart is the Transformers there at the bottom. Only 31 figures in the original three years were produced for the Transformers brand specifically which is a pretty small margin when you consider how many toys actually came out for the toy line. You know, and you know, and like I said, most of those came about because of the movie in 1986. Until then, you know, a few mini bots and that's about it. So, it's actually it's actually pretty impressive that Transformers in Generation 1 existed at all considering how much uh, they had to borrow from 
everywhere they could possibly think of. <laughs> like they, if if a toy company had a piece of plastic that turned into a robot, Hasbro wanted it in the mid '80s. So I hope that's a little bit of education for everybody to really take in and appreciate just how much went into making Transformers what it is today, or more likely what it was uh, back then. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you gained a little bit of knowledge from this. You know, whether it was just a, a quick breakdown or just seeing the figures, not action figures, like actual, you know. I hope you gained something. If not, you know, knowledge, then at least a little bit of perspective on our hobby. Guys, I am facing the most powerful enemy any YouTuber can face, the algorithm, and I need your help to defeat him. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and leave a comment. Every time you do, we attack that algorithm and we drive it back until it can no longer defeat this channel. Thank you very much.